Somewhere near here lives the killer they call the Yorkshire Ripper. His five-year career of killing began in the red light district of Chapeltown. On October the 30th, 1975, he killed a 28-year-old prostitute, and this killing was followed less than a month later by another at Preston, Lancashire. Even then, detectives suspected one man. Now, five years later, the death toll has reached 13, each death bringing grief and tragedy to the victim's family. So, what type of man is he? Psychiatrist Stephen Shaw has made a special study. An aggressive, sadistic psychopath. A man who fails to resist his impulses, does not learn by his mistakes, but above all is cold and callous. But any indication to his friends or neighbours or workmates that he might be a man of this type? When he's caught, people will say, yes, we should have known. I remember him talking this way or that. But at the present time, there will be nothing. He can behave in between the crimes perfectly normally. So last week, Jacqueline Hill became the 13th victim of the Yorkshire Ripper. And police here have no doubts that 10 of those killings were committed by the same man. So in five years of looking for him, what picture have they now built up of Britain's most wanted man? It's agreed that his height is around 5 feet 8. He has a strong Wearside accent and is probably in his early 30s. Footprints show that he wears size 7 Wellington boots. His letters show a peculiar sloping style of handwriting, suggesting he's slightly brighter than average. Because police fear the macabre possibility of copycat killings, they've revealed few details as to the Ripper's exact methods. However, it is known that a ball-pane hammer similar to this one has been used in the initial attack in most of the killings. So, does this now provide someone with a vital clue as to the Ripper's possible trade or profession? Engineering oil found at the Whitaker murder scene matched the envelope of the third letter, and the death of Joan Harrison also gave new information. It was teeth marks left on her body that gave police the valuable information that the killer had a gap between two of his upper teeth. And from the same murder scene, information about his blood type. It's Group B, which is only possessed by 6% of the population of Britain. It's been said that they know so much about the Yorkshire Ripper, but the only thing they don't now know is his real name. March 1978, they received three letters and a tape recording from a man with a Sunderland or Newcastle accent claiming to be the Ripper. I'm Jack. I see you are still having no luck catching me. I have the greatest respect for you, George. Good Lord. You are no nearer catching me now than four years ago when I started. Well, it's been nice chatting to you, George. Yours, Chuck the River. Hope you like the catchy tune at the end. Ah, ah. There's something about the injuries that worries forensic pathologist Professor Mike Green. The overriding feature was a single blow or two blows to the back of the head round about here. These were stab wounds. They were an unusual shape. But what was particularly unusual was that all of these wounds showed reinsertion. And this is one of the many things that makes this case so different from your typical homicide. I certainly have never seen another case like it, and I don't think many people will have. This was not frenzied. This was methodical. The wounds were inflicted in a pattern fashion, and then, and again, this emerged increasingly frequently, the instrument was inserted through the same wound. It was being pushed through the skin wound, partially withdrawn, so you had tracks going from the same hole, but in different directions on the inside. There was method all the way through this. Concentration, thought, and care. The dead woman is named as 28-year-old Irene Richardson. Marks in the mud around the body reveal another disturbing twist to the murder. Whoever had done it 
put himself in the position of the first person coming round the corner and almost like a film or television producer you could imagine him framing his shot and saying no that's not quite right let's go and spread the legs a little bit foot more and you could see the drag marks on the ground where the body had been rearranged at least twice possibly three times for maximum effect. It wasn't just arrangement of the body, there was arrangement of the possessions. The boots had been neatly arranged across the legs. The contents of the handbag had been neatly arranged to one side. I was deputy chairman of the West Yorkshire uh, Police Committee. And your name is John Warren. My name is Ron Warren, that's right. And you live in At that time, County Councillor Ron Warren. And yeah. I've lived in Bradford most of my life. So, um, uh, you were a member of the police authority, then you were deputy chairman. Yeah. And uh, during the Ripper investigation, you held that position all through that time. Uh, I was on the police authority all through the time of the Ripper investigation, yes. I was deputy chairman just before, uh, for about 18 months before he was called. Right. Can you tell me, um, uh, did you discuss um, the fact that there were two killers involved with any of the senior police and can you tell us how that came about? Well, it's difficult to remember at this late stage at what, when we first found out that there were two, but it was fairly obvious from the forensic evidence that of the murders that take place, there were two because there were two different blood groups involved. Right. And did, uh, did George Oldfield tell you anything about that? Well, George Oldfield knew about it, as did most of the others. Uh, whether I discussed that particularly with George, I don't know. I do remember that uh, at one lunch, I was sitting next to George, he thought he knew everything about the Ripper except his name. But, from his description, he was on the wrong one. But you're quite clear that the police were aware that there was two men involved in the crimes. Oh, all the police were aware. There I were. think if you was quoted in a speech of mine, the upper echelons of the police knew about it. Yeah, they knew there was two men involved. Oh, yes. Over five years, the police interviewed him nine times. question in relation to the Yorkshire Ripper murders. It is anticipated that he will appear before the court in Dewsbury tomorrow. Is it fair then to say that the general hunt for the so-called Yorkshire Ripper is now being wound down but from this moment on? Right. Mm. Yes. Well, can you tell us whether he has a Geordie accent? I cannot tell you that because I've not heard him speak. Can you give us any details? I can tell you that we are absolutely delighted with developments at this stage. Absolutely delighted. Can you, you, can you all smile? Really delighted. George is delighted as well. Yes. Absolutely delighted. Yes. The trial of Peter Sutcliffe began on May the 5th, 1981, at the Old Bailey. Sensationally, the judge, Mr. Justice Borum, refused to accept the defense counsel's plea of guilty by way of insanity on behalf of the Ripper. Impressed by a new confession made by Sutcliffe, both defense and prosecution counsels had agreed that he could plead guilty on the grounds of paranoid schizophrenia. But the judge insisted that only a jury could decide whether Sutcliffe was sane or not. <laughs> 